an opioid that is everywhere these days and everywhere, people who use it, including many who don't know they're using it, are dying. Thank you for joining us today for Let's Talk, a podcast series brought to you by Hazel and Betty Ford. I'm your host, William C. Moyers. And with me today, in studio and virtually, a panel of my colleagues and experts in the field of addiction treatment, research, prevention, and recovery. Dr. Alta Daru is the Chief Medical Officer at Hazel and Betty Ford. Dr. Quinn No leads Hazel and Betty Ford's Butler Center for Research. Dr. Stephen DeLisi is the Medical Director of our Enterprise Solutions Division. And virtually joining us is Carrie Hettinger, a registered pharmacist in Indiana and Kentucky who also serves as a Doctor of Pharmacy in the Enterprise Solutions Division at Hazel and Betty Ford. Welcome, everybody. Kerry, we're going to start with you virtually. You're coming to us from Kentucky today, I believe. What is fentanyl? Sure. Um, so fentanyl um, is an opioid similar to other opioids that was discovered in the the, F, the never-ending quest to find an opioid that could, could could have pain relief properties but not have the euphoric properties. They didn't find that with fentanyl, but what they did find was an opioid that really revolutionized surgeries. It was an opioid that was very potent, something that came on very quickly and then left the body very quickly. However, it's those same exact properties that, that have been so beneficial in surgeries that also have made it so dangerous as a drug when it's misused. Um, additionally, the fentanyl that we're using in those surgeries is not the same fentanyl that's being used right now and that's causing all the overdoses. Unfortunately, what we had with the, with the internet, um, we often will have the recipes, if you will, or the chemical formulas of how to actually make different medications. And that's what happened um, within the last couple of decades is that formula was released online and it allowed anyone to, to be able to access it and therefore learn how to make their own fentanyl. So it's the illicit fentanyl that we're seeing that's causing the overdoses very different than what we see in the operating room. And unfortunately, even though it has all the same potency and the same other properties like coming on very quickly and leaving very quickly, it also is often really contaminated um, with some of those manufacturing um, contaminants that can that can get into the the chemicals in the process. So, lots of reasons that fentanyl is very dangerous. Um, but the high potency and the fact that it comes on quickly are two of the most important qualities that are are really part of that overdose equation that we're seeing right now. Dr. Drew, how has fentanyl um, affected what we do at Hazel and Betty Ford? Yeah, great question. We see our patients coming into residential treatment facilities and they're aware that they're using something, possibly an opioid, and we're unsure of what that opioid may be. In the past, it's been heroin, which its base is morphine. But if it's something like fentanyl, the approach is very different. Fentanyl lives in the fat tissues, so it takes a while for it to come out. So it's not as predictable as heroin or morphine would mm. be. So our treatment patterns that we've used in the past, opioid agonist, buprenorphine naloxone, we can't use right away because the person doesn't go into withdrawal right away. Hmm. Traditionally hmm. in the past, with, with somebody has been using morphine or heroin, we can predict that they'll go into withdrawal 18 to 24 hours after their last use. However, with fentanyl, they may not go into withdrawal until two or three days. And if you were to start treatment with something like buprenorphine naloxone before the fentanyl has left the body, then you can put that person into a precipitated withdrawal. So even though it's not life-threatening, it's very uncomfortable for our patients, and we don't want that to be their, verse, their first perception mm -hmm. of what treatment is like. I want to come back to that and talk about how we've had to uh, re-educate our own clinicians. We'll come to that in just a minute, but I want to talk to Dr. DeLisi and Dr. Noah about the pervasiveness of fentanyl in communities, and particularly in communities of color. So Dr. DeLisi, if you would uh, tell us, what is the impact of fentanyl in communities that you work in? Yeah, so we work across the country with our training and consultation division, and I can tell you that fentanyl and analogs of fentanyl are everywhere. And they're not just in, it's not that the fentanyl is just in the opioid supply, it's in the methamphetamine supply, it's in the cocaine supply, it's in the benzodiazepine supply, it's in the marijuana supply. So one of the things that makes it so dangerous is we don't know what 
individuals are using when they're using any of the substances. Mm -hmm. It may have fentanyl in it. The, everyone has heard about the rising overdose rates. Those overdoses now are 70% of the time related to having fentanyl in the substance. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really been uh, catastrophic. And what about, Dr. No, in communities of color or inner cities and, and places um, uh, where uh, drug use is prevalent? So um, we have seen, uh, in, especially as the pandemic has started, that um, overdoses with, um, with synthetic opioids uh, and, and illicit use of opioids has really hit um, communities of color in particular. Um, so among black communities, among Native American communities, and I know Steve and his team has done a lot of work with that as well. Yeah, no, we, we, we certainly have because we've seen within the pandemic that overdose rates across the country have gone up, but in communities of color, African-American communities, Native American communities, much higher rates. In, in, in fact, there was just a study that was released this year that showed that for the first time since 1999, African-American overdose death rates were higher than white communities. And I would say that yes, part of it is the exposure in the, in the illicit drug supply to fentanyl and the other high potency opioids, but there's also been a disparity in our response within the pandemic, both in terms of the actual pandemic and the healthcare uh, for COVID-19, but also in our mobilization of the life-saving medications like, as, as Dr. Daru mentioned, the buprenorphine naloxone or naloxone that people know as Narcan, that hasn't been uh, equally distributed across our country. So Carrie, how, how do communities get educated around the impact of fentanyl and what to do about it? There have actually been um, several initiatives that I think are really helping to get the word out. Um, one of the most important ones is your local health department. Uh, local health departments um, work with the DEA. The DEA ha also has a website called One Pill Can Kill, which gives all of the updated information about any type of illicit fentanyl um, counterfeit pill that's out there. Like Steve was mentioning, we're seeing uh, fentanyl showing up in illicitly made benzodiazepines and illicitly made um, MD MDMA, which is uh, ecstasy. Um, and so the local health departments will get this information about what the FDA is seizing, you know, in some of their trafficking um, uh, operations, and they are putting pictures of those substances on their website. So first of all, contacting your local health department is really important. Um, additionally, there's a national harm reduction coalition that exists um, in the country, and there's a, there's a chapter in every state. And they offer different kinds of naloxone trainings, as well as, once again, these informational web pages, which are providing the information about what type of fentanyl is out there and what is active and prevalent in your community. Um, and that's a really important um, thing to understand, too, is that we see real regional differences in terms of what type of illicit whether it's fentanyl or a different kind of synthetic opioid that's related to fentanyl can be prevalent in one state, whereas another one can be prevalent in the state next door. Um, so understanding that um, finding out your community's um, kind of epidemiology is important. What about internally, Dr. Daru? How has fentanyl affected the education of our own clinicians and how we approach treatment of our patients. Yeah, so because it was unpre it's unpredictable and we can't treat it in the past like we, we would assume somebody's using heroin, we've had to modify our treatment. We would still use a buprenorphine naloxone, but now we give it in different doses. So we can microdose with small amounts of buprenorphine naloxone mm. to displace the fentanyl from the receptors, or we can try to macrodose. So we can give a lot of buprenorphine naloxone to totally wipe it away and treat the person that way. That's a discussion that we have with the patient because we do know that the patient's gonna be uncomfortable at some point. So that's really a shared decision that we make with our patients. The other thing that we've done is that we've really broadened our reach with Narcan training. So no longer is it just in the detox units, it's everybody on campus. Explain what Narcan oh, is. Oh, so Narcan is a, it's a life-saving treatment. It's a medication that preferably 
the easiest one is you give it a little nasal spray up the nose and Narcan wipes away the opioids from mm -hmm. the receptors that will allow a person to reverse the overdose. So it reverses the overdose when somebody passes out. And it's a life-saving measure that EMS carries Narcan, police carry Narcan everywhere out in the community. And so because our patients are at an increased risk for um, overdose, we've also asked all of our providers on campus to be familiar with Narcan mm -hmm. because sometimes when a patient comes into treatment, they may not be ready to stop using yet. Right, right. And, you know, it may be an issue where they're out on campus and they find a way to put some in their system and we have to respond. So because it's become so lethal, we've had to heighten this response and this education to all of our, all of our uh, colleagues mm -hmm. on our campuses. Dr. Nell, why, what were you gonna say? Oh, I was just gonna add to what Dr. Daru was saying and, and really say the important thing to know about Narcan too is that it doesn't hurt if you administer it to somebody who is not uh, having an opioid overdose. And that's, that's really critically important to know is that if it's suspected, if there's any thought that there might be op opioids on board, it's important if you have access to that Nar Narcan to administer it. Um, and, and I think this is really important right now because there are challenges in terms of um, the research behind fentanyl use, uh, which can impact clinical care, uh, you know, because patients and, and individuals don't always know if they're using it. So a lot a lot of times when we're collecting that data and we're trying to get that information about prevalence of use, oftentimes it's undercounted because someone may not even know that they've used it unless it's related to an opioid overdose. Um, if there is, um, but you know, many overdoses, if they're not lethal, mm -hmm. people may not seek treatment. And so we may not know that. And so many of the numbers out there are likely undercounts of actual fentanyl use. Yeah, no, that's very true. And, and, and William, at the community level, just to uh, expand to uh, across the country, because fentanyl and its analogs are in everything, there's a growing importance of training and access to fentanyl test strips. Yeah. And I just wanna make sure that anyone you know, watching and listening uh, to this today knows that they exist, that there are test strips. Where do you that, get them? You, you know what, it, it, for, uh, Carrie talked about the harm reduction coalitions that are in each state. They f uh, frequently have access to the fentanyl test strips. I know that in the, the state in which I live, the um, uh, nonprofit that does the naloxone, Narcan training and distribution now does fentanyl test strip and um, access to the test strips mm -hmm. so that if the individual is not yet at a place where they're stopping their chemical use, they're able to test those substances for the presence of mm -hmm fentanyl and it, it can save lives. So I just wanted to make sure that people were aware that, that that's out there. Yeah, Carrie, what, um, who should be trained in, in recognizing and responding to the threat of, of fentanyl in communities? Is it just doctors, is it just clinicians or are there others who need this training? Well, it's easy, it's one word, it's everyone, everyone. Um, but um, I'll expand on that a little bit. Yes. Yeah, so basically, um, the rule of thumb is that anyone that potentially could be a witness to an overdose should be trained in recognizing the signs and symptoms and in the response. Um, and given that the that we have this year once again now hit another record of overdose deaths. Last year was the 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 record in U.S. history, and now this year we've surpassed last year. So I think that that really, you know, kind of enlightens us in terms of all of us should be prepared to respond. And the thing is, is you can do some of these trainings online as well, and they will mail you the naloxone prescription. Um, so different states have different rules on their prescriptions um, on naloxone, but there are online agencies, Harm Reduction Coalition being one of them. You can do a quick online training that takes 15 or 20 minutes, and then they'll mail you the naloxone. But certainly if someone in your family is someone suffering from a substance use disorder, um, or if it's just very prevalent in your community, all healthcare professionals, most certainly. Dr. Noah, I want to, um, I know you're the, the leader of our research at Hazel and Betty Ford, but I want you to put that psychologist hat on for a second and, <laughs> and, and, and answer this for me. Why is it that with the um, dangers of fentanyl and, uh, and, and the toll it's taking in this country, as Carrie was just talking about, why is it that that 
fear alone is not enough to get somebody to stop using or to make sure that what they're using doesn't have fentanyl in it. What is that about? That's such a great question. Yeah. And, and I think it really gets at um, our, the way we talk about addiction and alcohol and drug use, fentanyl use in our country is really, um, you know, we think of it as a, you know, oftentimes still a moral failing. Like if you would just stop, if you could, just, you know, you know it's bad for you, you know, so just stop. Um, and it, that really ignores the impact on the brain that drugs have um, and, and the impact of previous traumas. Um, and so if it was just a matter of will, right, our country would probably f be full of really healthy, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> you know, we, you know, like strong, like, you know, exercising super humans, right? If it was just about willpower, right, we would not have that extra slice of pizza or we would put down that donut. Um, it's, 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 it's not that easy, right? It, it is a combination of um, habits that form. And so, you know, our, our muscles even learn, you know, routine and habit, our brain learns that. Um, and so we really have to understand that the only way we're going to address this, the only way we're going to um, really help with, with, fent with this fentanyl epidemic um, and with addiction overall is with good treatment, science-based, data-driven treatment um, that has underneath it a lot of compassion and understanding for the impact that alcohol and drugs has on our bodies and our brains. Dr. Drew, how is... What do you see in terms of the future of addiction treatment as it relates to highly deadly drugs like fentanyl? So I'm, I'm hoping, and what, and what we're seeing in um, the innovations part that, you know, that we employ with, HB, with Hazleton Betty Ford is new ways to treat opioid use disorder and withdrawals. So not only will we be using opioid agonists like buprenorphine, mm -hmm. uh, naloxone, but also patient wearing devices, apps that have been, you know, there's data to show that some apps work and some other FDA approved devices other modalities so that our patients have options instead of just going to one tool. So I see that as the future of treatment for opioid use disorder. What about, um, I'm gonna put you on the spot here, mm -hmm. what, because I didn't tell you, I was gonna tell you, ask you this, <laughs> but you are the chief medical officer, and he's on Betty Ford, so mm -hmm. here we go. What about recovery management on the back end? How, how, how do you think the application of 12-step abstinence-based with medication uh, tools will, um, will evolve to support people after they have treatment and are needing to stay abstinent from So, so I think there's going to have to be, and, I, and we are looking into this, more higher touch opportunities, oh. more opportunities to engage that patient once they've left our residential treatment, yeah. whether that be IOP later on, more engagement with counselors, uh, virtual opportunities, applications that they can use with um, their personal devices. So more of an opportunity to stay engaged with that patient after we help them with the skills that they need to learn to mm -hmm. treat their substance use disorder, more of this engagement and, and wraparound care on the back end. So do I hear you saying that recovery from fentanyl dependence or opioid dependence in general is possible? Oh yeah, oh absolutely, absolutely. Lots of success stories out there. And what about the training of doctors and other healthcare professionals, Dr. DeLisi? We know that they're in the front lines, whether they're in the emergency room or in the, in the p a pediatric center. What role does training of docs? Yeah, a absolutely. The tra training of, of docs and across the healthcare system is, is critically important. We've made strides. Over the past decade, we have seen a, an increase in the training on substance use disorders, opioids, alcohol, in our health professionals, and it's having an impact. We see the impact that uh, we've, we've had, and we're gonna continue to double down on, on uh, training and education. Uh, medical centers are increasing their curriculum on uh, addiction, and that's really important. The other thing that I, I, I would say in, in your question about recovery is the exciting uh, move in the field with peer support specialists. And that's where there's training, both for peer support specialists to get uh, the training that they need to have more impact with patients, but then also the healthcare professionals on how to integrate with and work with peer support specialists. So what we're seeing, William, is a blending of the 
uh, treatment providers and the communities of recovery where people live, bringing them together. And I, th I think that's one of the most exciting movements in the field today. So go ahead. Yeah, definitely, Steve. Yeah. You know, I would agree with that, the, the ongoing care, that the mm -hmm. treatment doesn't just stop with yes. the three weeks. And yes. one thing I would also augment with the medical students is the SIMS program, how we're actually bringing them into training. And we're, we're reaching down into the medical schools and inviting them in for a mm -hmm. look at what we do so that they can get acclimated and introduced to addiction medicine. We've covered a lot of territory today, but and Carrie, we started with you, so we're going to end with you in the 35 seconds that we have left. Just if there was a magic wand that you could wave in, down in the trenches or at the community level as it relates to addressing fentanyl and, and even addiction in general, what would it be? There was a magic wand. Um, I would want to speed up the research um, because we have so much exciting research going on that's looking really deep into the disease of addiction. Um, for a long time, we really only kind of knew the superficial aspect of the disease. And now we're going deep into the brain and we're discovering the root causes and we're really facilitating this research that's actually going to be treating the root causes. So if I had a magic wand, I would speed that up so we can get this information out there. We also have vaccines in the works as well that will help uh, opioid use disorder and methamphetamine use disorder. So get that faster. <laughs> All right, good job. And we'll bring the four of you back a year from now and we'll see how that magic wand has actually applied to what we do at Hazel and Betty Ford and out into the communities as well. We're out of time, but I wanna thank uh, Carrie Hettinger and Dr. DeLisi, Dr. Quinn No, and Dr. Daru for joining us. And thanks to all of you for tuning into this important conversation about the opioid fentanyl. We hope you'll tune in again to learn more about substance use disorders, treatment, and recovery issues. We'll see you again.